to be or not to be? Hello, we are the Minnesota 4-H B team, and we're really excited to present our findings to you today. Our, our survey yielded some very interesting results that we think are actually going to be very pertinent and useful to Minnesota beekeepers. So first, we want to introduce our team, coaches, coach, and mentors. Our first mem member, Manashri, uh, was not able to attend because she's visiting family in India. Hi, I'm Sophia. I am very excited to be here today. I um, love bringing projects to the fair, but from the very beginning, I just felt this was so much bigger because our team didn't want to uh, present something that we already knew, but something that we discovered that so I'm very excited to present to you what we did today. Hello, I am Justin Wheeldrar, and I really enjoy being a part of 4-H because it presents me with unique opportunities like being in this challenge. I've always been interested in bees from both an agricultural standpoint and a biological one, but this, uh, this project has really allowed me to develop that interest further, and I think we came up with some really interesting results. Hi, I'm Will. And I have done 4-H projects uh, about entomology, but nothing specifically about bees. After this project, I loved bees so much that I got my own hive. And I really like working with them. All right, now we want to introduce our mentors. Our first mentor is Dustin Vanoss. He's a commercial beekeeper who owns Bear Honey in Maplewood, Minnesota. He taught us about beekeeping, hives, issues that affect bees in Minnesota, how to network with Minnesota beekeepers, and he helped us to identify issues to study that were most important to Minnesota beekeepers. Our next mentor is Mark. My dad. <laughs> yeah. He's a database analyst for our US bank, and he taught us how to build a database and organize data. Mary is a biological statistician for a biomedical company in California. She helped us understand tools statisticians use to determine statistical significance, which had uh, a lot of importance in our results. Our coach is my mom. She helped us stand track, set goals, organize our study, and she helped us find really nice mentors. So Justin, why are bees important to agriculture? Well, let's take a look, Will. Bees produce agricultural commodities such as honey, beeswax, propolis, uh, pollen, and venom. The value bees bring to crop agriculture through pollination is huge. Bee pollination accounts for $15 billion in added crop value alone. Here are some things that bees bring to the table. Things like apples, almonds, cranberry squash, pumpkins, and broccoli. So, what challenges do beekeepers face across the United States? I'm glad you asked, Will. <laughs> For one, or wait, okay. Beekeepers across the United States are struggling to maintain healthy bee populations. One of the most destructive problems they face is American fowl brood. American fowl brood is a bacterial infection that targets the honey brood which is where they lay their eggs. And it's the most widespread disease affecting bees today. Another problem they face is varroa mites. Varroa mites are a blood-sucking parasite that will affect both brood and adults. Another problem is the tracheal mite. They're mites that live and lay eggs inside the trachea of the bee. What challenges are unique to Minnesotan beekeepers? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's go take a look. Minnesota beekeepers have a lot of trouble with the long and harsh climate of the winters because it's very cold and it's very hard for the bees to make it through. Our team wanted to study something unique to Minnesota beekeepers that would arm Minnesota beekeepers with information that could help them make wise and informed decisions and that didn't repeat work that had already been done by other studies. First we wanted to study how well adapted different breeds of bees were to Minnesota winters, but in order to study the outcomes of different bee breeds, we had to account for all other variables that could affect our outcomes. 
Our variables were so numerous and so dynamic that it would have been impossible for us to isolate a single variable without at least considering them all to some degree. So, what variables affect the overwintering outcomes in Minnesota? Why, well, let's go take a look. So, we spoke with beekeepers and did research to identify what variables they believe affect successful outcomes for overwintering. Some common theories uh, on what improves overwintering outcomes are things like pre-winter honey stores. Bee breeds are another thing that could affect. Um, specifically, Italian versus Russian bees. Another factor is hive type, where we wanted to identify if the type of hive that people use to overwinter their bees made any difference in the overwintering process. Another one is hive position, such as sun and wind exposure, and also hive insulation, which helps protect against the cold winter. Hive, Will is right, but when a hive is insulated, most experts recommend beekeepers provide extra ventilation through auger holes to prevent excess moisture. Another factor is mites and mite treatments. We wanted to both identify how these mites would affect the bees in their overwintering and how the treatment of mites would affect the bees. So how do we gather information about these factors and determine their effects on the successfully overwintering bees? Gee, I don't know, Will. Let's see. In order to get the most information to assess the overwintering outcomes and account for all our variables, we concluded that a survey would be the best tool. So, what are the pros and cons of a survey? Well, well, the cons include the fact that it removes us from the study source, allows subjectivity in the answers, we cannot control the data quality, and the survey results are not as scientific. The pros are, we're able to collect much more data, and the variables are better isolated. Also, the data reflects real-world beekeeping, combinations, and methods. And also, it gives beekeepers an opportunity to invest and connect to this study. So, what did our survey look like again? Let's have a little bit of a refresher. We asked beekeepers for some general information, like their experience with beekeeping, and, uh, and other factors like their location that could affect the outcomes. Then later on, we got to more specific questions where we isolated specific groups of hives that they had and the variables that affected them specifically as opposed to other groups of hives so that we could see how those variables affected their outcome and success after the overwintering process. Our results. We were looking for what affects successful outcomes in overwintering bees in Minnesota, so we had to identify how we would define success. These are the variables that we saw as being the most important in determining success, and we wanted to come up with an equation that would give us a percent success value for this logic equation, where splitting of the hives was given the most weight in this equation, since uh, splitting of the hives is a really good, uh, just kind of good general indicator of the health of a hive, because for you to split a hive, all the other factors would need to be uh, fairly prevalent and fairly strong in the hive. Then we gave general hive health bee population and honey stores their 30%, 20%, and 10% rate uh, weight success uh, subsequently. So here are the three outcome variables that we were testing our variables against. Our success uh, logic comparison, hive splitting outcomes, and our survival outcomes. Now, these are some results from our actual survey, where we used something called a chi-squared test to determine a p-value. And what a p-value is, is it's a numerical value that will tell you how much of an impact a certain, a certain factor had on an outcome variable. So here you can see that we're, co we're uh, comparing our b-breed factor to our survival outcome variable. And our p-value is 0.01. If a p-value is below 0.05, it's considered to be statistically significant. And the lower the value is, the more statistically significant the, the factor on the outcome variable. So since it's 0.01, bee breed has a significant effect on our survival. And if you look at our table here, you can see that uh, the Italian bees have uh, 
a lot more unfavorable outcomes than the other bee breeds. Bee breed also had a significant effect on hive splitting and our logic comparison. And in both of those, you can see that Italian bees still had the highest number of unfavorable outcomes, which is interesting because Italian bees are the most common type of bee in Minnesota. Now we get to the first one of our factors that didn't seem to have any meaningful effect on our outcome variables, which is hive type, which is something we wanted to identify. This is not surprising, but it was a good thing that we could isolate it and decide if it had any effect. Now we get to our ventilation, specifically the auger holes that uh, beekeepers use to ventilate their hives. Auger holes were statistically significant for survival, hive splitting, and our logic comparison. And this is not surprising as it supports expert opinions on the importance of ventilation because if you don't ventilate your hive properly, moisture can collect inside of the hive during the winter, which can lead to the growth of fungus and mildew, which will negatively affect the, uh, the health of the hive and lead to disease. Now, this is the first one of our variables that didn't affect our outcomes that was really surprising to us, which is the age of the queen. The age of the queen didn't affect survival, hive splitting, or logic. But the reason this is surprising is because the majority of beekeepers who were involved in our study suggested that, uh, that the queen age would be a significant variable in determining success. However, the results we got back from our survey didn't seem to suggest this made any statistical difference in the success of the hives. Now, our honey store to hive population ratio didn't affect survival. It also did not affect hive splitting according to our results, but it did have a slight effect on our uh, logic comparison. However, if you look at it, it's only barely affecting it, so this may not be as important a variable as others. Now, our wind exposure affected both hive splitting and logic in a statistically significant fashion, but it did not affect our survival. This seems to suggest that although wind exposure does not uh, directly affect the survival of the bees one way or another, it does significantly affect the success, as you can see specifically in our hive splitting comparison where it has a 0.00045 p-value, which is extremely low. Now sun exposure, as opposed to wind exposure, has a significant effect on all of our outcome variables, including our survival. And this is not surprising because, as I mentioned earlier, the growth of mildew inside of the hives is a significant factor uh, in uh, the spread of disease inside the hive, and sun exposure is a really great way to deter the growth of fungus and mildew. Now, our insulation, surprisingly enough, I even with the harsh Minnesota winters, on its own did not test as significant for uh, survival, hive splitting, or logic. However, insulation in conjunction with a moisture board uh, tested it as significantly, uh, statistically significant for both survival and our logic comparison. This may suggest that insulation, along with proper moisture control, may have a much more significant effect on the success of hives than either one individually. Now, here we get to our most surprising statistic, which is our Varroa mite assessment. On our logic, it has had a 0.000057 effect on the p-value. It did not have any effect on hive splitting according to our chi-squared test, but it did have a very strong effect on survival as well. The thing that's surprising about this variable, though, we already knew that mites were going to be a big factor. What's surprising is not that it affected the results profoundly, it's how it affected the results. If you look at our table up here, you can see that uh, you can see that groups of hives that had mites and were treated on the left had three groups of hives that survived and ten groups of hives that died out. However, one column to the right, you can see that hives that had mites and were not treated for mites had fourteen groups of hives that survived and only nine that died out. This is very surprising and exactly the opposite of what we expected to find. We expected to find that treating hives for mites would uh, be a good factor in the success for hives, but those weren't the results we got back. Uh, in support of this, we found that hives that had no mites reported but had preventative treatments had zero surviving groups of hives and six groups of hives that died out. And mites that had no uh, groups of hives that had no mites reported and were not treated had a 50-50 survival rate. Now, 
this, the, this was definitely the most surprising thing that we found. And we don't know quite what to make of this yet or quite why this is the case, but it's definitely something that warrants further study and that we look forward to studying in more depth next year. Now, here are the results of our survey uh, kind of summarized, where you can see our three uh, outcome variables and the factors that affected each one subsequently in the most profound and significant way. Now, here you can see we have two um, little graph things. And we asked in our survey all the beekeepers what they thought would be most important for the overwintering of the, or the overwintering success of hives. And they listed in this order over here. But what's really surprising is our results from our logic and data that we have collected is a lot different than what we might have thought. Now, how we have shared our results with others. We, mailed, we emailed our results and conclusions to all beekeepers who requested them. Our results are going to be published in the August edition of the Minnesota Hobby Beekeepers Association Journal, and we have received several requests for live presentations of our findings by local beekeeping clubs. In addition, we summarized our project and findings in an article about pollinators in the Minneapolis Star Tribune and have performed our presentation for our 4-H club. So, here's what we accomplished. We identified factors that appear to most contribute to favorable outcomes when overwintering bees in Minnesota. We extrapolated possible uh, correlations between factors' relationships to each other such as insulation and moisture boards, and rural mites and insulation. All right. We now know which factors warrant further study in this area of agricultural science, and have been able to share some surprising, informative, and highly valued results with the beekeeping community. So, um, I have made this model beehive, and maybe, well, do you want to explain all the Parts? Sure. Okay. okay. <laughs> that concludes so. our actual presentation. Yeah. <laughs> and we can go through the hive if you want during our question. I have a question. All right. Okay, sent your survey out to beekeepers. Mm -hmm. um, was that across the state? And how many beekeepers did you actually send your surveys to? Um, we know that the more surveys, I guess I, I want to know how many surveys went out and mm -hmm. what you got in return. All right. Well, uh, originally we were going to send them out all across Minnesota, uh, but there was some mix up, there were some communications errors where uh, people who were going to send it out to certain people. Uh, there, there, there was some kind of disconnect, and it didn't get sent out to certain people. Uh, it, we, the, our results come from Stillwater, and originally we wanted to get uh, many more areas covered, uh, but eventually we just had to decide we were going to eliminate uh, the area as a variable. So this is, these, are, these results are specifically for Stillwater uh, as an area, uh, and, but we could get some more uh, widespread results with a similar study in the future. As you continue yeah. to do your research, is it your hope that you will be able to survey additional communities because of the div diversity in our topographies, our, uh, even in Minnesota, the different climates? Oh, yes, definitely. Uh, I have no doubt that there are going to be different results from different areas of Minnesota because there are so many factors that can affect something like this. So that's definitely something to keep in mind when considering the results of the survey. And. Uh uh, just so you know, we interviewed, uh, like, we had 200 hives about in our survey. So it wasn't as much as we wanted, but uh, it was a uh, nice amount for us. If I can ask maybe a question about that. I'm Robin Popo with Jenny Electric and Sarah Camino. Um, how did you identify the... I can have a loud voice. Thanks. <laughs> how did you identify the top three issues? For your project, American 
foul brood, the mites. How do you determine those were the top three? I, I definitely think that had something to do with Dustin Vanoss. Dustin Vanoss was a very helpful mentor during this because, well, as I said, he owns Bear Honey, so he has a lot of experience, not just with honeybees, but with the beekeeping community. And he was able to help us determine what factors were most important. And that contributed significantly to the variables we decided to test in our survey. Uh, and uh, talking with our biological statistician, Mary Otterness, uh, she said that for the sample group that we have, the number of uh, statistically significant variables is very surprising. Because with a sample group of our size, usually it's harder to determine what's statistically significant. So uh, Dustin Vanoss really helped choose very pertinent variables. Kind of maybe one more follow-up question too. How many N surveys did you get back then? It sounded like you had sent out, I forget what number you mentioned, but what was the N survey count? Uh, N survey count? Uh, I can't remember exactly. I believe, like, last time I looked at it, because I wasn't handling that part of the data, last time I looked at it, we had 24 uh, survey results. But the thing about the survey results is that each one represents uh, several groups of hives, because each beekeeper has, obviously, several groups of hives that are all treated uh, in specific ways. Maybe just one more, too. Yes. You talk about your statistical model that you set up. Did you mm -hmm. have enough data? to validate a statistical model? Uh, yes, yes. We, uh, we didn't have as large of a sample group as we wanted, but it's definitely enough to draw some uh, very definite statistical conclusions, especially with our chi-squared tests. OK, so maybe just some clarification. So is it safe to say there was 24 or so or more, more beekeepers that you worked with that had up to 200 hives? Is that? Or you had said 200. Altogether. Altogether. Yeah. Right. Around 200 hives. Right. Total. 200 hives. right. So distributed b yeah, among distributed those 23 or 24 yeah. beekeepers. Yes. Okay. So you said Although this. I'm not entirely sure that's the correct number of beekeepers. Okay. Because that was from a while ago. Gotcha. So when you did your survey, you sent that out and asked them to report initially what they thought was going to make a difference in the overwintering? Yes, we had them identify uh, issues that they believed would most profoundly affect the success of the overwintering process, mm -hmm. and then give us uh, sets of data from each of their hives so we can compare what they suspected would be the most important with what actually affected it most uh, significantly. OK, so you asked them as far as bee loss and mm -hmm. what, what their actual practices were that they implemented to help overwinter them. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. OK, awesome. Adam Burr. Adam Burr, Minnesota Corn Growers. Um, going to your your uh, success logic outcome mm -hmm. and the equation that you developed there, you you assigned some weighting factors to each mm -hmm. of those four components. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about how you derive those weights to those four factors? All right. Well, that was actually a fairly simple uh, part of our process, where we just decided which. Well, I wasn't actually the one. We, we talked with Justin Vanoss to get an idea of which things were most important. And from that information, we decided from, uh, from our factors which ones would be most important. And from there, we just weighted them evenly uh, from 100%, uh, with hive splitting as the most important as just kind of a general overview of the success. So sort of professional judgment you mm -hmm. used uh, based on your, yeah. your mentor that you was using to, mm -hmm. to assign those percentages. Yeah, but we didn't want to use this as our only variable because there is some subjectivity in this as an outcome variable. So we also tested it against our individual hive splitting outcomes and survival outcomes. I'm, I'm not a mic fan, so help me. They can, they can hear you. We, we can hear you. Thank you. Uh, Mark Hammerling, uh, Minnesota Corn Growers. Uh, my question is about the bee breeds, uh, and, it, and it's really sort of an informational question from my standpoint. Uh, you talk about the, the most common breeds, the Italian and the Russian, but you also talk about the Minnesota hygienic and hybrids. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I am not genetically literate. Um, the the uh, hybrids, do those occur naturally? Uh, can you have a, 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 a hybrid? Uh, say Italian and Russian bee oh yeah and, and if so do you run into that a lot and why how is it that that this doesn't happen all the time can you can you talk about the yeah. interbreeding of bee species yeah so bees can interbreed so uh, like the species different species of bees that you bring in will interbreed with each other that's why you get uh, mixes between say Russian and Italian if somebody has both Russian and Italian bees 
the reason you don't see this everywhere on like every single uh, every single result is because uh, beekeepers often stick to uh, single types of bees where they'll have their uh, they'll have like a bunch of Russian bees or a bunch of Italian bees. Uh, it's really in the ones that decide to take both, which aren't quite as common, where you end up getting more hybrids. Or you can specifically breed hybrids. And Minnesota Hygienic, explain that to me. Uh, Minnesota Hygienic is just uh, another bee breed that, we, we, that was fairly common, very cl fairly commonly used, so we made it its own category. I failed to introduce myself before. I'm Amy Smith. I'm a ag ed faculty member here at the University of Minnesota. Hello, I'm super Amy. Hi. I'm super excited to, to hear more about this, and I was looking forward to um, it when I saw it on the list. I'm actually one of those aspiring beekeepers. I've told my husband that I want to you know, get hives, and I don't have him convinced yet. Um, but from your research, and granted, I don't live in the Stillwater area, so I know there's some things that you can't. What advice would you have for people, and maybe, Will, this can be something that maybe you can speak to as far as how you made decisions as to what bees you selected and what you're going to do to overwinter successfully. But what advice would you have for beginning beekeepers? Well, Will, this seems to be your area of expertise. Okay. So, um... Well, um, I would suggest, well, based on our data, you should probably get Russian bees. <laughs> um, Definitely, there's a lot of professional advice that you can read from uh, beekeepers who have been doing this for a while. That's, a de that's definitely a good thing to do to get started, yeah, um, is to just read up on things. It's a good idea to start in the spring, because then they have a whole season to build up their hive before going into the winter. And, um, um, and also, don't, don't, uh, don't sacrifice ventilation for insulation. Because bees actually, bees keep themselves warm by uh, using their wing muscles to generate heat. So they can deal with heat a lot better than they can deal with uh, disease from mildew growth.